So, um, good morning, Freddie. Thank you so much for being here. Freddie. Okay, so um, I just want to remember, you know, I thought of something while I was watching these, Frank. Frank and I, in 2003, were working with SAG New Media, and we were on a committee to help them with their contracts. We did the first contract for... We could blame you. No, they didn't listen to us, which is why uh, they had issues eight years later. We actually um, suggested that they pay their talent $100 a flat rate a day, and then as the, the business boomed, then we could start implementing residuals because we'd know how to monetize it and how to implement it. So but they a, said zero. Right. They said we're going to put you know, under their commercial, some, some contract, the one, zero. My company, we do only SAG actors, only after actors. We're completely signatory. And the one production only agreement is a dream come true from the producer's side. Uh, basically, you can it's fully negotiable rate. By law, you're supposed to pay minimum wage to your actors and to anyone on your set. But, uh, you know, the, the EEOC is not there to enforce that every day. So okay, but John, I want to hold back because I want to get off the stage. This is Frank's show. Okay. Love right. you, Frank. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, a round of applause for the filmmakers and their films. So, um, uh, starting with Freddie. Freddie, which one was yours? Uh, ours was the, uh, the uh, first person Mario one. So, if there's, if there's no uh, video game fans in here, it may be slightly obtuse. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> All right, well, that was yeah. Freddie Wong, and it was called Mario? Uh, we call that one First Person Mario. First Person Mario, yeah. okay, cool, all right. Now, I'm, I'm figuring you probably guessed which one was Dane Buffs. <laughs> it was the last one. Yeah. <laughs> with the zombie with the cold. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, great, all right. Now, John Franks, we're gonna see shortly, we're saving the best for last. It's on the web, yeah. Those of you with iPhones, just watch it now and pay no attention to us. <clears throat> all right, then. So, um, for all you f folks watching uh, out there in, in a streamy land through the fabulous efforts of J.D. Pichet and the folks over at Mingle Media, you can't see it, but there are over 700,000 people in the audience right now. They are clamoring for us to begin the panel, and boy, do I wish I could. So, here we go. Um, let's start with uh, this question now. Once upon a time, filmmakers waiting for their big break had to go through a series of Hollywood gatekeepers to succeed. They would have to do things like submit a 20-minute shorter screenplay to indifferent production companies. They would have to struggle to get an agent. They would have to endure soul-crushing rejection, years of setback, and poverty. What is your advice to 21st century filmmakers? Should they greenlight themselves with web videos? Yeah, I think, I think that goes without saying, just because you have the uh, you have the ability to now, and it's kind of I think foolish to not take advantage of everything that technology allows you to do. You know, so I think a lot of it is um, taking advantage of that, and a lot of that is sort of recognizing how to use it. You know, in the same way that television is you know sort of fundamentally different as far as a medium is concerned than the film, and the same way it, it, it you know goes that. Uh, web video and, and web series is fundamentally different than how television works. So if you go into it with that same perception, like, all right, I'm just gonna make this like TV or whatever, or, or just make a feature, it won't necessarily translate, it won't necessarily work as well. It's a matter of taking the time to see what's out there, see what plays, mm -hmm. and uh, adjusting your strategies to, to more fit the uh, medium that you're going for. Cool, cool, cool. Dane, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think there's, uh... I think people have a tendency to think that that this all just happened overnight. And to, to some degree it did. I mean, for, for Annoying Orange and stuff like that, um, for you guys too, we actually, you know, we did a lot of stuff before this. And it was a big build-up. And it, How many videos did you do before Annoying Orange, would you say? Me, hundreds. Hundreds? Yeah. Not just hundreds. On my, not just on my YouTube channel. because Hundreds! <laughs> I would do, you know, uh, as far as, as well as doing my full-time job, uh, working as a like a videographer for a newspaper and a uh, newspaper website, and working at photo labs and stuff. I would always do like business videos, any any kind of video work I could do, uh, entering short film festivals, just anything. And then, you know, I started getting to the point where I'd win a film festival, and then I would use that money to buy better equipment 
and then you do it. Wait, wait, you won money in film festivals? Yeah, well, online video This contests. is breaking news, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the first thing I ever did, uh, first thing I ever won was a short video contest, like a one a one minute video contest uh, for Bolt.com, which is kind of like a MySpace. It's defunct now. It's uh, and um, wait, MySpace is defunct? No, hold it. <laughs> no, no. Well, yeah. <laughs> but then you know, then with that money, I was able to buy a new camera, and then you know, I was able to get work doing business videos, and then. From there, I started doing YouTube videos slowly and surely, you know, just built and built and built until finally, you know, for some reason, the Annoying Orange just took off. But I mean, this was like 10 years, you know, in the making. Mm. Um, so I think the point I'm trying to make is just, yes, use every resource you can and try and do everything that you can to practice your craft and uh, use the tools that are available. And so for John Frank, because you have a long history in old media, traditional showbiz, however one wants to call it, uh, what was your first web video that you said, okay, I'm making this video for the web? Okay, so my first web video was for CompuServe in 1993. And in those what? days, you couldn't actually stream full media down the internet. So you actually had to send to your subscribers in advance a CD that had all of the media that you wanted to call on. And then you would send a series, just a quick series of numbers down to it, and, and you'd have it be like having uh, actors and sets and locations and, and all of those things, and you would send it down, and you could only make movies and media out of the stuff that you had already provided to the end user. Damn, that's in 1993. Before it was when 9200 was the standard. Wow, Freddie was born in 1994. <laughs> that's exactly right. And it wasn't SAG, and it wasn't Writers Guild, it wasn't PGA, it wasn't any of that. Wow. Um, and it, you know, it, it was well received for the time for what it was by both. Um, Audience members, yes. There were actually people looking at that stuff and playing it. It was a lot, of, a lot more interactive than it was. A lot more choose your own adventure. Uh, CompuServe in those days was all about mining information. So you had people who really yeah did them really a lot of good, didn't they? They yeah. didn't want to pass. They didn't want to be so passive. Uh, CompuServe uh, mm. invented something called the Visa Clearing Center, and every time you run your credit card, it is cleared by Merrill Lynch through CompuServe's headquarters in Columbus, Ohio. Mm. The CompuServe Information Service was something they ran at night to use the extra cycles on the machine. Wow. Generate a little money. CompuServe's doing just fine. That's why wow. AOL Thank you, Bill Gates. Right How do you like that? I liked my CompuServe stock very well when AOL bought it, as a matter of fact. Oh, okay. All right, then. So, um, uh, so I started making stuff back then. It wasn't really until uh, Warner Brothers got into it big in like 95, 96 that uh, you could start actually beginning to stream video style content. I made a series called Digital Access and the Business and just a whole series of stuff for Acme City and entertained them and there was no audience for it and it wasn't generating any income and everything was all about banner impressions and you know the whole department was just collapsed after AOL bought Warner Brothers. And AOL does a lot of buying. And uh, basically at that point, uh, YouTube had still not come into the front, so basically you'd be making new media for telephones and uh, things for CD. And the first time I met with the new media department at William Morris, it was one gentleman, Lewis Henderson, in a, on a, in a desk in a hallway at William Morris <laughs> talking about the majesty of the CD-ROM and how it was going to replace carts. Uh, mm -hmm. cartridges, which was the previous data method. And basically, th at that time, the way you got into the movie business was, as you said, you would send in scripts. My company, uh, we, uh, I wasn't there, of course, when they made the Academy Award winning movies, but uh, when they made them, they got such a, 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 they were so well known that we would receive about 3,000 scripts a month from people who wanted us to look at their materials and to consider it. We would get hundreds of reels a week on VHS to try to find the next great director. And basically, the barrier to entry was so high because you had to shoot on film, you had to shoot on videotape, you had to have expensive equipment, expensive edit equipment, and it looked homemade unless you had access to a film school or professional video studio. That's not the case anymore. The barrier to entry has collapsed. People can shoot HD video on a tiny little device that can be shot on television. Can be shown on television. Anytime I wanted to shoot something for one of my TV shows, I'd have to carry a giant ENG camera. All right. It's the way to come in. That, that's, that certainly answers the question. Thank you very much. Now, I have particular insight on, on some of our panelists, uh, uh, so I'll start with uh, Freddie. Uh, Freddie uh, was not quite a, a I was, what was, what was I? I was, I was a professor at USC and you were a student at USC and we would get together and you would explain things to me of how things were going to be and I would say, 
that sounds awesome, really? And that was pretty much our classes. But I remember you showing up to talk to my webisode class at USC, and you presented information on the board of like how people would respond to different, do you remember this? How people would, res would respond to different types of video. You, in other words, you were doing what I would call almost scientific research on what works on the web, and this goes all the way back to 07, I think, if I remember correctly. So that, that incredible research and knowledge that you had back then, does that, tell us a little bit about you know, what you were researching and how it affects what you do today. Basically, Brandon and I, we, I don't know, it's what we did. We got bored. We'd watch web video. We would see what played and see what well, what did well and what what, you know, what was popular and what uh, people reacted to. And, that, you know, obviously that changes over time. But that's something that just throughout our college career, that's just something we always kept an eye on. And uh, we did two things. We basically, we'd, we'd launch new videos on different channels. We'd start, we'd start channels that had absolutely nothing, you know, like no traffic going there. And we'd put videos out there and see what they'd go, if, what they'd do if we basically put different amounts of effort into, you know, driving traffic towards them. Like if we put them on Facebook, if we did this, we did different things. Mm. We can run. And then videos that we didn't do ourselves, we'd, we'd pick out videos, we'd try to find videos very early that we thought had the potential to go viral or go, to go around. And we'd, we'd watch those very carefully and see what where they were getting their views from, what 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 order blogs picked up on them, what order like you know, different things happened. And so basically, we were able to sift out exactly how things would get launched on the internet and how things would get passed around. So you were basically benefiting from my knowledge without paying tuition on it, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay. All right. Now um, uh, I want to come back to the 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 Freddie W two channel in a moment, but first, Dane. That was a very instructional video uh, as well. We, we all seem to share this love of not just creating the content, but educating others about it, which is really neat. And it was the, one of the themes for this panel. That's why I chose everybody. And um, uh, Dane, you know, talk, talk to us about you know, what you did there, and, and you know, how does it make you feel, and, and do you want to do more, and what's the purpose of doing this? Uh, the Knowing Orange in general, or just everything? Or? Well, the instructional part of it. Oh, the, the, the sharing of the knowledge, yeah. Yeah, I, well, there's so many people out there that ask, you know, those questions. Like, how do you do that? I get hundreds of questions every day, uh, and emails and, you know, comments just saying, hey, how do you do it? And I think, you know, I was, I remember being in that same position, too, when I was a kid, seeing stuff like, oh, my God, they blew that car up. How did they do that? <laughs> That's Freddie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's wanting to give back to the audience, too, because, you know, you, they're, they're a huge part of that. Without the audience, you got nothing. So right. we, I, I want to be able to, and I think we all do, want to be able to share some of those insights and those secrets and uh, kind of give back a little bit. Which is, which is amazing because, you know, all of you guys, and John Frank came and spoke at my class down at, at, at Chapman, and all of you guys are literally magicians who are pulling the curtain back and saying, this is how it's done. The, John, does this sharing of this knowledge, do you think it takes away anything from you know, the, the experience itself? Yes. There's no question that when you start to look at media analytically, you don't enjoy it as much as a viewer. You have to turn that part of your brain off and say, I'm going to escape into it. When you let people behind the curtain, uh -huh. you're, you take a little bit of the magic away. But people are really interested in it now, and I think actually it brings more viewers to your product if you're telling them how to do it, because people have access to this equipment, mm -hmm. and they're interested in knowing how it's done. I mean, look at how successful Entertainment Tonight is and all those shows that take you behind the scenes. And so even though I think it, it, it may detract slightly from your enjoyment because you're becoming more analytical, why is it lit like that? Why are they moving like that? I think it's actually better for um, production as a whole. Now, I want to take a poll of the 700,000 people in the audience here and see if you guys agree with that, because I actually differ with that. For me, having gotten to know Dan a little bit better through his videos, for me, having you know watched uh, uh, Freddie's behind the scenes channel, it actually adds to the enjoyment of it for me. So let's take a poll. Um, of you guys, how many people feel that you would rather not have that behind the scenes stuff? Just raise your hands there. And how many people feel that uh, the behind the scenes stuff benefits you, and that's 698,000 right there. You're the winner. So, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. But I'm not here to prove you wrong. I'm here to make you look good. So, no worries. what can I say that it can kiss your ass, John? Hire me. Hire me. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Um, so, uh, Dane, 
You're at what, 1.8 million subscribers now? Yeah, yeah, on YouTube, yeah. On YouTube, okay. And um, uh, at what point did you quit your day job? <laughs> As Freddie said, tell him about my Facebook. The, the Facebook has 8.5 million. 8.5 million on Facebook. It's crazy. Holy cow. Wow, that's over half this audience. <laughs> <laughs> and it grew. People walked in. So. It's weird. It's weird to see, you know, like the YouTube subscribers, and then look at the Facebook page. It's, you know, I I can't explain why it's like that, but there's it just because he's got such a cute face. That art. Maybe that's it. Yeah. I want to see the pictures. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> Holy cow! Thank you, Freddie. So, at what point did you quit your day job? Did you ever have a day job? Yeah. I mean, I, I've had different day jobs all through my life, and the, all the while, I've always made you know, short videos while doing that. Um, I worked on Pit My Ride, I worked in photo labs, like I said, I worked as a videographer at a newspaper for their website. Which, which newspaper? Uh, in Bakersfield, the Bakersfield Californian. Wow! <laughs> Boy, are they kicking themselves now. <laughs> <clears throat> wow, we could have had the next Charlie Brown. Shit. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but uh, but like I said, I've always been doing stuff while I've been uh, doing those full time jobs, and it wasn't it wasn't until more recently, um, you know, right after the orange really took off, that I just completely quit everything else, went full time YouTube, and let me tell you, it's exil it's scary, but it, it's been the best uh, best time ever. And so now you've got from you know the video we saw that you've got you know a, successful enough to have a a, a, a kitchen in your garage. Does, yeah. that, does this mean you have to park your car in the kitchen? <laughs> yep, exactly. Okay, all right, good. And Frank, he it's can lucrative, it's not that lucrative. You can yeah. only do that because of the access that YouTube gives you to monetize your own distribution. Yes. Which yes. never was the case, back to your original question, which there were only the, the seven big studios and the three networks plus Fox was the only place to go to get money. And now you can make your own program in your garage, put it up on the net, and collect directly from the viewer. And so you get immediate response and you can afford to do that, whereas before, you would have to be an employee of one of those major corporations. Yep. What he said, yes. <laughs> I like that. That kind of sums up the panel. You can all go now. Um, <laughs> don't run for the fire exits. Um, the, uh, so, so YouTube used to be synonymous with uh, lolcats and cringe-worthy production values. Do you think that the perception still exists in the, of, of that in the general public? Do you think people still see YouTube as sort of the, you know, the, the, the resting grounds for dead elephants? It's, it's changing quickly. It's um, basically the, the low point of YouTube, as much as I love them, was, uh, was a couple years ago when uh, Fred was really coming out. Because that was the, the biggest time when there was a huge media push showing everybody YouTube and showing everybody this is what's going huge on YouTube. Can I just say you're insulting Fred and there's a two-year-old in the audience who's going to kick your ass now. <laughs> I know. And, and, and we really like the content, but, but the problem is that people, they, they look at it and they don't understand that this is a kid's show and it's for kids. And that's who's enjoying it. And therefore, I mean, they understand that with Dane stuff because it's a cartoon. They don't understand with Fred stuff because it's live action. I still get it, though, too. People are like, it's the end of the world. It's a talking orange. How is this popular? <laughs> <laughs> but basically, the, most of the country was, was introduced to YouTube with Fred. And they saw that, and everybody took one look and went like, that's, that's oh, interesting. That's getting a lot, but I don't like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's been a long like rebuilding from that point. So we've gone from Fred to Freddy, basically. Yeah. You've elevated the culture, have you? <laughs> yes. More letters, yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. So, um, yeah, no, I, I certainly agree with that. And, and the, the range of stuff that's happening on YouTube is, is just incredible. You can see everything, period. I mean, there's nothing you can't see on YouTube except possibly porn. Believe me, I've checked. <laughs> Repeatedly, every night. Um, but uh, that being said, you know, now what about film schools? We're sitting here at the Los Angeles Film School, and uh, and I teach at a couple, and you've all been and spoken at and, and that sort of thing. Um, I find that at the at the film schools, people are still really focusing on that grand opus, twenty twenty five minute, thirty five millimeter, you know, mother honker. What do you what do you think about that, John Frank? All right, well, I made one of those at USC Film School, and I made all my Super 8 films, and you know, we still did a little bit of video, and cut on Avid, and sent out the EDLs, and, and all of that. And I think it's a great way to learn how to appreciate film, and the art of filmmaking, because it's mm -hmm. certainly an art, mm -hmm. and to deliver a certain kind of message. 
but it isn't very connected to where the industry is going right now if that's going to be your job. And I mean, I went to school with a lot of people at USC that aren't in the film business anymore. They have a you know, quarter million dollar film degree, don't go into film. Mm. Uh, probably because I have to pay for that degree. <laughs> but uh, nowadays, you know, people are, especially with the situation in Japan and the videotape shortage, people are moving immediately to digital, they want to shoot on P2 cards, uh, nobody wants to do transcoding anymore and importing, they want it all direct HD off the camera. So you do a bit of a disservice by forcing the students to get together in their groups and to fight their way through film, because shooting on film is an expensive and difficult process. Mm. On the other hand, you're forcing them into the bonding situation that helps them in their career in the future, because the most important thing that I learned at film school were the names and numbers of the people I went to film school with. <laughs> Because wow. that's where you get your next job. Not so much on my student film that, you know, I could put up on YouTube and no one would watch. <laughs> Don't be so overconfident. <laughs> Dane, wh wh where was your support network? I mean, we saw your buddy on screen there, and that's awesome. But where did you grow your support network? Um, well, you know, it started in college, of course, uh, back in, in Minnesota. Uh, I was going to say... Which college in Minnesota? Uh, Moorhead State University, Minnesota. Okay, shout yes. out for Moorhead State yep. University in Minnesota. Yes. <laughs> All right. Right next to, it was right on the border of uh, North Dakota, so very cold. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, so you had to bond just for warmth. Yeah, then. exactly. <laughs> you just had to huddle with people in small places. <laughs> okay. Um, but as far as, you know, we, of course, you know, uh, it was a very small class, and so we all got along really well, helped each other out a lot. And so I, I totally agree, you get that bonding experience. Um, and shooting on film, too, uh, I actually found it, it kind of helped because it forces you to really restrict yourself as mm. far as, like, you know, not being Stanley Kubrick and shooting, you know, hours and hours and hours of footage. It really, you know, you gotta, you gotta break it down before you actually shoot. Um, but for me, as far as after school, once I moved out here, it was actually, you know, going to, like, the rogue dinners and meeting other YouTubers and things like that. And, the, you know, that's, that's kind of become the support group now, is uh, the other YouTubers. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Great. So you guys sit in a circle and bitch together, <laughs> yep. which is awesome. Wow. Even though y'all are in direct competition with each other, right? No, it's different. TV's different. You don't, we don't really compete with each other. Yeah, it's, well, you're competing for two minutes of people's attention at a time, which is like... You can always take another two minutes off of your, of your, of your lunch break. You know, like, <laughs> for what we do, it's it's never like okay, a huge commitment where it's like oh, this weekend I gotta go. It's either this movie or this movie. It's it's no problem to to, to say. <clears throat> this, I mean, we're not at the point where it's like ah, oh, there's too many entertaining, too many well produced, too many videos. I can only pick a few. You know, it's it's not a problem. If so on. Hopefully that day comes. Yeah, exactly. So ideally, at one point that does happen. But at the point, right now, it's 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 wide open and people's time is abundant and plentiful. And the places where you can see these videos too is abundant and plentiful too because you know if there's wireless everywhere and there's video on your phone and, and, and all that. So really you have so many possible places, so many possible choices and all that sort of a thing. So um, Freddie, the, the, the Freddie W2 channel that is so amazing. I mean it's, it's literally like you're making other movies the day that you're making a movie. <laughs> it's so instructional and so and so great and so behind the scenes and the camaraderie that you bring to your crews and, and everything like that. What's the how do you keep that going? Why do you keep it going? Well I mean Who's paying you, fucker? <laughs> <laughs> um, well there's a lot of it was like when we, you, you watch behind the scenes on DVDs, it's just like you know, like Brian and I growing up with Dane, right? When you growing up you watch it behind the scenes on DVD, it's like the most disappointing thing in the world. Because yeah. you're like, I want to see how they made this movie. And then there's 15 minutes of them talking about how it's like this director was the best director to work with. And the director <laughs> cut to the director is like, this writer is amazing. And the writer's like, these actors were great. And everyone's like, okay, so I got that you guys had a great time. I have no <laughs> idea what how you did it. And literally, like Brandon, you were saying like you would see like something in the background, and you pause it, and you'd be like, what's going on there? Yeah. yeah, no, I'd be watching the interviews on the behind the scenes, because, because my, my original hobby was uh, was pyrotechnics. Um, initially, my approach to film was I wanted to learn how to do pyrotechnics and come out eventually. Which is a perfect thing to do in the dry wheat fields of Nebraska, but <laughs> <laughs> good no, thing you didn't go to his school. Yeah, I wanted to do special effects, and so I was trying to learn from behind the scenes and stuff to try to you know, hone the craft. And But of course, they never actually talk about that stuff. And so in the background of the interviews, you'd sometimes you'd catch people setting stuff up, 
and basically figure out based on that how things were being done. And so eventually piece it all together and figured it out. <laughs> came out yeah. So behind the scenes for us, it's like they're all it's it's all it's all PR puff pieces for everybody. You don't actually learn anything from it. And it's really disappointing because we wanted to learn stuff from it and it was it wasn't there. So that was kind of the impetus there. It was it, it was man, there's a there's got to be people kind of like us out there who are curious about how movies are being made, uh, but there's you're not getting any information anywhere because I remember how difficult it was just farming through film books and trying to understand how the heck they're doing this. And it was, it was, you know, eventually it just ended up being trying it out and experimenting. Whereas now it's like, well, it's, it's no skin off our back to be like, hey, here's how it's done because it's something that we were curious about and something that some other people are curious about too. Well, cool. Um, I'm gonna now take three questions from the audience. So let me start with uh, this gentleman. Um, Stand up, state your name, and I'm serious, questions, not statements. Questions, not diatribes, okay? I will cut you off. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Uh, name's Eddie Carrington. I was, question for, I guess, everyone here is, at what point, or how, I should say, how did you differentiate yourself from the din that is YouTube, though, or on the internet? When did you, or how did you do that process? Okay, so uh, he asks, how do you differentiate yourselves from the din that is YouTube? Uh, you you got you get ninety nine percent of the way there by step one maintaining a consistent content schedule. So picking a we do one a week. Some people do two a week. Um, anybody who has found success on YouTube has had at some point a long consistent schedule that they've stuck to, and that's important because that already that differentiates yourself because it means you're committed to create content, and you get the other one percent by. Um, having a level of production quality that is sort of above the baseline. Minimum. Okay, so Those regularity and production quality, what do you say, Dan? I agree 100%. Okay. I couldn't say it any better. All right, then. The, the other big thing is that YouTube is a humongous site. If you try to stand out on YouTube, you, it's like saying in the middle of a crowd of a million people and trying to shout. You need to first target smaller sites, you know, little, uh, little forums, uh, huh. web blogs. Basically, if you get your content out there first, and you form a small audience there, that translates and that audience is watching then over on YouTube and you can go to there. So basically, if you, if you try to target the front page of YouTube right off the bat, you'll never get it. You have to target smaller sites and then you work up to it. I have enough trouble targeting the front page of funlittlemovies.com and it's my website. Who would want to screw it to, anyway. You gotta utilize things like Facebook and Twitter and just email bomb all of your friends and family back home and you know all those things utilize as much as you can to try and get your stuff seen cool the guy from Nebraska is talking about email bombs I'm scared now <laughs> John Frank they're right on the money you've got to have a consistent schedule uh, where material comes out there's nothing worse than ramping up and getting millions of people watching your production your program and then suddenly it just drops off because you haven't gotten it picked up somewhere else and I get so much email about series that we have discontinued Ooh. almost more than series that we're still doing it's not thank yous for discontinuing it's not thank yous no. um, production quality said is vital if you're going to stand out um, also a niche marketing uh, for my kind of stuff I do a lot of science fiction fantasy and we have ongoing movies and DVDs, and we already have fan lists, so we market directly to them. We put trailers for our webisodes on our DVDs when they're released for our movies and our other things. Mm. And so the niche may be small, but it's very, very deep. And so if you're just trying to service a particular community, a particular target, we, we don't get, I mean, I get 13 million views on Bybee, but we don't normally get the views that million. these gentlemen are getting. Nice. And, uh, but we're happy with those, the limited amount of views we get because we're getting, we're building our brands, we have ancillary uh, materials to sell to them, and it cross-pollinates our other productions. So for us, it's, it's very specific key marketing. Very, very good, okay. Uh, second to last question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, Freddie, you mentioned some research that you did on uh, what's working, what people are watching, and where, and is that information available to any, any of us anywhere? Is it on the web? So Freddie uh, did some research as to what works and what doesn't. I'm repeating the questions for the 700,000 people out there. Um, uh, Freddie was uh, doing research on what works and what doesn't, and Freddie, is any of that research available, or do you just want to sell it to her? <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was part of a uh, thesis project that I did at USC. Uh, there's a couple things about it, like some of the fundamentals of it are, uh, are still the same, a lot's changed in the time since. 
Um, but yeah, I, I got to, it's on the web somewhere. I got to figure out what it is. <laughs> on my on my blog, um, I, I put together like a uh, fairly long sort of article. Uh, it's freddyw.com where where I talk about like YouTube specifically and YouTube success and sort of the principles that we had on that. So that's probably the best bet. It's probably the source of the most up to date information on that. Okay, and then the last question is going to come from my uh, wife and partner, Lynn Spire Chindamo, who is the host of 610,000 fans at uh, myspace.com slash internet stardom. Internet stardom. Myspace.com forward slash internet. Hello. <laughs> Take three.